Здравствуйте, my fair weather friends, and welcome to another episode of Kachimuchi's Game and Spooks. In today's episode, I shall be narrating yet another creepypasta classic. As much as I adore the Lovecraftian theme of horror being something we cannot see, sometimes the things we can see can prove to be even more frightening. And like many internet creepypastas, all this pasta needed was a single image to launch itself into infamy. Instead of myself offering a summary at the beginning of the story as usual, the creepypasta fandom site offers their very own summary instead, which I shall recite now. Smile Dog Smile Dog's story consists of a classic horror setup. An amateur writer visits the house of a lady who supposedly has a story from which he can borrow from. Rather than speak, however, the lady has locked herself up in her room, crying and ranting about nightmares and visions and various other problems. All of these center around a floppy disk she had been given that contains the image smile.jpg, which is smile.dog. Other cases of this have cropped up. Viewing this image incites insanity, and no copy of the exact image exists on the web, though likenesses of it do. The true image of smile.jpg is recognized due to the effect it has on the viewer, that is, they wind up dead. Attaching the file, that is, spreading the word, is the only way to save oneself from the smile.dog that appears in one's dreams, demanding to spread the word. Some say that the original legend began with the image of the devil, and I myself couldn't put it in any better way than that. And so, without further ado, let us begin Smile Dog by an unknown author. I first met in person with Mary E. in the summer of 2007. I had arranged with her husband of 15 years, Terence, to see her for an interview. Mary had initially agreed, since I was not a newsman but rather an amateur writer gathering information for a few early college assignments, and if all went according to plan, some pieces of fiction. We scheduled the interview for a particular weekend when I was in Chicago on unrelated business, but at the last moment, Mary changed her mind and locked herself in the couple's bedroom, refusing to meet with me. For a half an hour, I sat with Terence as we camped outside the bedroom door, I listening and taking notes while he attempted fruitlessly to calm his wife. The things Mary said made little sense but fit with the pattern I was expecting. Though I could not see her, I could tell from her voice that she was crying, and more often than not, her objections to speaking with me centered around an incoherent diatribe on her dreams, her nightmares. Terence apologized profusely when we ceased the exercise, and I did my best to take it in stride. Recall that I wasn't a reporter in search of a story, but merely a curious young man in search of information. Besides, I thought at the time I could perhaps find another similar case if I put my mind and resources to it. Mary E. was the system operator for a small Chicago-based bulletin board system in 1992, when she first encountered Smile.jpg, and her life changed forever. She and Terence had been married only for five months. Mary was one of an estimated 400 people who saw the image when it was posted as a hyperlink on the BBS, though she's the only one who has spoken openly about the experience. The rest have remained anonymous, or are perhaps dead. In 2005, when I was only in the 10th grade, Smile.jpg was first brought to my attention by my burgeoning interest in web-based phenomena. Mary was the most often cited victim of what is sometimes referred to as quote-unquote Smile.dog, the being Smile.jpg is reputed to display. What caught my interest, other than the obvious macabre elements of the cyber legend and my proclivity towards such things, was the sheer lack of information, usually to the point that people don't believe it even exists, other than as a rumor or a hoax. It is unique, because though the entire phenomenon centers on a picture file, that file is nowhere to be found on the internet. Certainly, many photo-manipulated simulacra litter the web, showing up with the most frequency on sites such as the image board 4chan, particularly the X-focused paranormal subboard, it is suspected that these are fakes because they do not have the same effect that the true smile.jpg is believed to have, namely sudden onset temporal lobe epilepsy and acute anxiety. 
This purported reaction in the viewer is one of the reasons the phantom-like smile.jpg is regarded with such disdain, since it is patently absurd. Though, depending on whom you ask, the reluctance to acknowledge smile.jpg's existence might be just as much out of fear as it is out of disbelief. Neither smile.jpg nor smile.dog is mentioned anywhere on Wikipedia, though the website features articles on such other, perhaps more scandalous shock sites, such as hello.jpg or two girls one cup. Any attempt to create a page pertaining to smile.jpg is summarily deleted by any of the encyclopedia's many admins. Encounters with smile.jpg are the stuff of internet legend. Mary E.'s story is not unique. There are unverified rumors of smile.jpg showing up in the early days of Usenet, and even one persistent tale that in 2002, a hacker flooded the forums of humor and satire website, Something Awful, with a deluge of smile.dog pictures, rendering almost half the forum's users at the time epileptic. It is also said that in the mid to late 90s that smile.jpg circulated on Usenet and as an extension of a chain email with the subject line, Smile, God loves you. Yet despite the huge exposure these stunts would generate, there are very few people who admit to having experienced any of them, and no trace of the file or any link has been discovered. Those who claim to have seen smile.jpg often weakly joke that they were too far busy to save a copy of the picture to their hard drive. However, all alleged victims offer the same description of the photo. A dog-like creature, usually described as appearing similar to a Siberian husky, illuminated by the flash of the camera, who sits in a dim room. The only background detail that is visible being a human hand extending from the darkness near the left side of the frame. The hand is empty, but is usually described as beckoning. Of course, most attention is given to the dog, or dog creature, as some victims are more certain than others what they claim to have seen. The muzzle of the beast is reputedly split into a wide grin, revealing two rows of very white, very straight, very sharp, very human-looking teeth. This is, of course, not a description given immediately after viewing the picture, but rather a recollection of the victims, who claim to have seen the picture endlessly repeated in their mind's eye during the time that they are, in reality, having epileptic fits. These fits are reported to continue indeterminably, often while the victims sleep, resulting in very vivid and disturbing nightmares. These may be treated with medication, though in some it is more effective than others. Mary E., I assumed, was not on effective medication. That was why, after my visit to her apartment in 2007, I sent out feelers to several folklore and urban legend-oriented newsgroups, websites, and mailing lists, hoping to find the name of a supposed victim of Smile.jpg who felt more interested in talking about his experiences. For a time, nothing happened, and at length I forgot completely about my pursuits, since I had begun my freshman year of college and was quite busy. Mary contacted me via email, however, near the beginning of March 2008. To jml at asterisk.com From Mary E. at asterisk.net Subject Last Summer's Interview Dear Mr. L., I am incredibly sorry about my behavior last summer, when you came to interview me. I hope you can understand that it was no fault of yours, but rather my own problems that led me to act out as I did. I realized that I could have handled the situation more decorously. However, I hope you will forgive me. At the time, I was afraid. You see, for fifteen years I have been haunted by Smile.jpg. Smile.dog comes to me in my sleep every night. I know that sounds silly, but it is true. There is an ineffable quality about my dreams, my nightmares, that makes them completely unlike any real dreams I have ever had. I do not move and do not speak. I simply look ahead, and the only thing ahead of me is the scene from that horrible picture. I see the beckoning hand, and I see Smile.dog. It talks to me. It is not a dog, of course. Though I am not quite sure what it really is, it tells me it will leave me alone if I only do as it asks. All I must do, it says, is spread the word. 
That is how it phrases its demands, and I know exactly what it means. It wants me to show it to someone else. And I could. The week after my incident, I received in the mail a manila envelope with no return address. Inside was only a three and a half inch floppy diskette. Without having to check, I knew precisely what was on it. I thought for a long time about my options. I could show it to a stranger, a co-worker. I could even show it to Terence, as much as the idea disgusted me. And what would happen then? Well, if Smile.Dog kept its word, I could sleep. Yet if it lied, what would I do? And who was to say something worse would not come for me, if I did as the creature asked? So, I did nothing. For fifteen years. Though I kept the diskette hidden amongst my things. Every night for fifteen years, Smile.Dog has come to me in my sleep and demanded that I spread the word. For fifteen years I have stood strong, though there have been hard times. Many of my fellow victims on the BBS board, where I first encountered Smile.JPEG, stopped posting. I heard some of them committed suicide. Others remained completely silent, simply disappearing off the face of the web. They are the ones I worry about the most. I sincerely hope you will forgive me, Mr. L. But last summer when you contacted me and my husband about an interview, I was near the breaking point. I decided I was going to give you the floppy diskette. I did not care if Smile.Dog was lying or not. I wanted it to end. You were a stranger, someone I had no connection with. And I thought I would not feel sorrow when you took the diskette as part of your research and sealed your fate. Before you arrived, I realized what I was doing. I was plotting to ruin your life. I could not stand the thought, and in fact I still cannot. I am ashamed, Mr. L, and I hope that this warning will dissuade you from further investigation of Smile.JPEG. You may in time encounter someone who is if not weaker than I, then wholly more depraved, someone who will not hesitate to follow Smile.Dog's orders. Stop while you are still whole. Sincerely, Mary E. Terence contacted me later that month with the news that his wife had killed herself while cleaning up the various things she'd left behind, closing email accounts and the like. He happened upon the message above, he was a man in shambles. He wept to me as he told me to listen to his wife's advice. He'd found the diskette, he revealed, and burned it, until it was nothing but a stinking pile of blackened plastic. The part that most disturbed him, however, was how the diskette had hissed as it melted. Like some sort of animal, he said. I will admit that I was a little uncertain about how to respond to this. At first I thought it was perhaps a joke, with the couple belatedly playing with the situation in order to get a rise out of me. A quick check of several Chicago newspaper online obituaries, however, proved that Mary E. was indeed dead. There was, of course, no mention of suicide in the article. I decided that, for a time at least, I would not further pursue the subject of Smile.JPEG, especially since I had finals coming up at the end of May. But, the world has odd ways of testing us. Almost the full year after I'd returned from my disastrous interview with Mary E., I received another email. To jml at asterisk.com From elzahir82 at asterisk.com Subject, Smile Hello, I found your email address through a mailing list. Your profile says you are interested in Smile Dog. I have seen it, and it is not as bad as everyone says. I have sent it to you here. Just spreading the word. Smiley face. The final line chilled me to the bone. According to my email client, there was one file attachment called, naturally, Smile.jpg. I considered downloading it for some time. It was most likely a fake, I imagined. And even if it weren't, I was never wholly convinced of Smile.jpg's peculiar powers. Mary E.'s account had shaken me, yes, but she was probably mentally unbalanced anyways. 
After all, how could a simple image do what Smile.jpg was said to accomplish? What sort of creature was it that could break one's mind with only the power of the eye? And if such things were patently absurd, then why did the legend exist at all? If I downloaded the image, if I looked at it, and if Mary turned out to be correct, if Smile.dog came to me in my dreams, demanding I spread the word, what would I do? Would I live my life as Mary had, fighting against the urge to give in until I died? Or would I simply spread the word, eager to be put to rest? And if I chose the latter route, how could I do it? Whom would I burden in turn? If I went through with my earlier intention to write a short article about Smile.jpg, I decided I could attach it as evidence. And anyone who read the article, anyone who took interest, would be affected. And even assuming that the Smile.jpg attached to the email was genuine, would I be capricious enough to save myself in that manner? Could I spread the word? <laughs> yes, yes, I could. <laughs> The end. And that was the story of Smile.dog by an unknown author. I must say, it isn't often that a creepypasta involves the reader of the story. But I have to admit, I don't think there's any story that does it better than this one. This creepypasta is definitely worthy of its legendary title. What with its ingenious writing and twist ending... The story expertly chronicles the existence of Smile.dog, whilst leaving the reader completely unaware that the author has been under its influence the entire time. Fun fact, do you remember how in the last email it is sent by a one Elzahir82? It turns out Elzahir is the name of a short story by the Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges. In the story, Azahir is an object which causes another person to become enthralled and obsessed with it, losing touch with reality and becoming more and more engrossed with the Zahir. And though the author is Argentinian, the story is very Lovecraftian. Very Lovecraftian indeed. Of course, I am nowhere near smart enough to have discovered that literary reference on my own. After all, the only stories I read are creepypastas. So the credit for that discovery goes to the creepypasta wiki user Ephipicus192000. Beyond that, I especially enjoyed the story's theme about a single image that could render a person completely insane, or at the very least, haunted for their entire existence. It doesn't get more Lovecraftian than that, after all. And I'm sure any person who saw a picture of Jeff the Killer when they were young can attest to that personally. Myself, especially. I mean, seriously, as an adult, I fear very little. But even now, that picture of Jeff the Killer still scares the hell out of me. Smile Dog, not so much, but it's part of the story, so it's excusable. And now, before I go on any more tangents, I would like to thank you for watching or listening to this episode of Kachimuchi's Game and Spooks. Why not do us a kindness and leave a like, or subscribe? This has been Kachimuchi, and that's about all I have to say about that. Farewell.